What's up folks and welcome back to the shores of Eternum. I apologize for taking so long to get resituated, but I am just coming back from a very successful Crusader Kings 3 campaign and I finally have a moment to catch up. Today we're going to be jumping right into this recently posted article by GamesIndustry.biz. It features Scott Lane from Amazon Game Studios and dives into some of the details we've been wondering about all this time. Let's go ahead and get started. It starts off by giving a brief introduction to the fact that currently, the market for MMOs is being heavily dominated by long-living giants such as Guild Wars 2, Elder Scrolls Online, Final Fantasy XIV, and You Know Who, which I definitely agree with and at this point, am kinda sick to my stomach of. Scott Lane says the decision to make the MMO known as New World stemmed from a deep love of existing games alongside a desire for change. The article then goes into some detail that we already know. Scott Lane has personally had a deep love for games like World of Warcraft, Ultima Online, hell yeah, and Black Desert, alongside survival and fighting games. But more recently, he's been more fascinated by action RPGs like Diablo and Dark Souls, which is where I'd like to butt in. This game reminds me, and I'm sure quite a few others, of an action RPG but in MMO form. Like if someone took one of my favorite old school RPGs like Fable, the Gothic series, Two Worlds, Kingdoms of Amalar even, or of course, Dragon Age Inquisition or Greedfall, and meshed it with an MMO world and threw it in the oven as ready to go. After these past few years of covering and following this game, I think I know what direction they're trying to go. And I want to say right now, right now that no matter what I say, no matter what the next guy says or his friends say, as an RPG gamer first, I believe in this vision. New World isn't without its flaws. It needs polish, there's things that need fixing, things that need adding like more weapons and content which I'll go into some more in the future, but this direction can work. I think a lot of people have become so used to the way normal MMOs function that it's difficult for them to accept anything new, which is why I'm hoping that multiple upcoming MMO titles work out instead of just one be all end all. But I've gone on long enough and you guys didn't come here to listen to that, so let's get back to this article. It continues on with Scott Lane explaining how since everyone is always looking for the next MMO, but developers have been shifting their focus to other genres, Amazon Game Studios saw it as an opening to introduce their MMO with this combat system. And with it being very skill-based and physics-based, despite it needing tweaks and additions to improve the experience, I personally do like it a lot and wholeheartedly disagree that it needs major changes to be successful. Now where the article starts to get juicy is when he talks about why they chose the 16 to 17 1800s as a starting point. They chose it because it's the last point of sword and shield plus plate mail being popular, and the first breath of muskets and firearms, alongside stating that their plan is to incorporate characters from other time periods past and future, which is one of the only things I needed to hear to be excited. If you guys don't remember, back in May I made a video about New World teasing the past civilizations of Eternum. I made this video because of a tweet they put out showing what clearly looked like a viking longship. This also shows up in the Game Awards trailer alongside a Japanese design of a ship that's wrecked on the coast. You can also see these inside the New World tutorial area if you looked around. This hinted at the fact that besides the Romans we see in the trailer, there were most likely other civilizations that visited the island. Which means in the future, when they expand the map by making the island bigger or creating new ones, maybe we'll come across past civilizations or the remnants of them, which also might include new weapon and armor designs, like from the Greek civilizations for instance. Getting confirmation of this is really exciting, and I would probably play this game forever if it incorporated characters from these time periods. Give me Alfred the Great, Alexander without a doubt, anybody related to or the man himself Ivar the Boneless, Genghis Khan, Attila the Hun, Julius Caesar, there's so much potential there. I also want to mention how during one of the tests, I found a lore page that further supports this idea. I can't show the screenshot because the first time I found it, it was before the preview event, but here's the wording of what it said. Not only do we get details of a civilization like China existing in this world, but Greek and Egyptian as well. But after that, Scott confirms that they do plan to run regular updates for New World around once a month, and he publicly talks about how this was done through the alpha, which I can attest to and I can say that they were pretty good at it. They were capable of putting out a great deal of content in those month to month periods, and a lot of what you saw during that preview was actually much newer than you thought. He also says there's a consideration for expansions, but nothing concrete yet. This is something I really hope does happen though, because I remember during a previous article like I mentioned before, not only did they talk about expansions being a possibility, but naval combat as well. Something I believe would be absolutely perfect for New World, along with other islands to explore. 
Price point wise, he confirms that it should still remain $40 for the game, but also still include the cosmetic microtransactions. So with this information, we can probably be sure that they're still going with the housing furniture and Twitch Prime Cosmetics being involved as well. Skipping down to the last part that further supports this, we get reconfirmation that they still are going for the Twitch integration that we found out about a long time ago. Of course, this mechanic sounds like it would only apply to Twitch along with their streamer spotlight, which personally, I totally get it. But the next part is a little iffy for me. Scott Lane concludes that Twitch success will be a key metric for him knowing if the game is successful or not. Now, I wanted to dive into this because I don't agree that it should be. See, both Twitch and YouTube are very unpredictable when it comes to MMOs. A lot of times, viewers don't stick around on these types of games because they can be very tedious to watch. Looking at someone grind on the same thing for 20 hours to progress isn't always fun. A lot of times it comes down to the conversations we have with our viewers. But even then, not all of us can be that entertaining, myself especially. So viewership of these games tend to be a little on the low side. Take games like Elder Scrolls Online, Final Fantasy XIV, or even Guild Wars 2. Before they got their bigger expansions and updates, outside of their game launches, I remember their viewer retention being very low. World of Warcraft is an exception to this, of course, but even that has had its high periods of downtime. Whereas, like Scott mentioned, you look at other genres and there's a massive shift. Their popularity blows our genre out of the water and has for a while, and I expect New World will be in the same boat no matter what. We had a lot of people viewing it during the preview, but like I said, outside of the game launches and even the events, there's going to be a lot of downtime. So I think instead, maybe it would be better to look at all the platforms collectively, alongside player numbers after your big updates and judge from that. But that's just food for thought. That being said, thank you all so much for listening to me ramble for a few minutes. That's all I got for you today. Have a wonderful night or day, and farewell.